reading your work, reading Us, his first book, England's Green, his second and very recently published collection, both with favor. Uh, it was a revelation to me and a uh, great uh, excitement. And I, I wanted to take our rubric sources for poetry in the you know, uh, serious and literal way and ask you both maybe some biographical questions about where poetry has come from and continues to come from in your life, uh, as well as uh, what perhaps sources of particular poems uh, are, uh, or, or, and, and how a particular poem might unfold from a source. Um, but we, we got started conversing about these topics uh, over dinner recently, and uh, so far you, you talked to me about uh, poetry coming for you at first maybe out of something you called, I believe, a trouble with words. <clears throat> Can you talk to us about that? Um, yeah, I think, I think I was very hesitant around language when I was young. Um, I was a quiet kid. Um, my son who's here is much more comfortable speaking and, and, um, as anyone who's met him here will know. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was very quiet, I kind of hide, hide a little bit and I, later on I developed a bit of a stutter. And so, and I think that was me almost not wanting to commit to what I was going to say or something, as if I was scared of that. And so there's a real hesitancy around language, I think, that, um, that probably crops up a little bit in my work. No, not, not directly, I, I don't think I've written so directly about that, but I think it's, it, it, it's, um, I think it's probably affected me subconsciously more, you know, and having these conversations, I realize how much it has affected me. Um, trouble with words. I'm thinking immediately of so many poems that you've written uh, at this stage of your career that are in some way about a word yeah. uh, or about um, language in, in uh, often a particular way. I'm thinking of, for example, poem Hill Speak um, from, from Us. Um, that, that's a poem that, that, that uh, ends with a, you kind of avowing being at a loss for words. But per perhaps uh, you could talk to us about that poem in particular and, and the issues that it brings up. Yeah, well, that, that was really the first proper poem that I had published. Um, it was a poem about oh. my, my father's language, and I sent it off along with about six other poems to, in Britain, what's called the National Poetry Competition. Um, and I, I suppose I got lucky and I got a third prize, which I got a thousand pounds and I got to read it out in front mm -hmm. of lots of the British poetry kind of royalty, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that, that was my, and that was the first reading I ever did actually. Mm. I, I, I'd never done an open mic reading or reading at the local pub or something. I'd never done that. <laughs> so my first reading was like kind of in front of the poet laureate and all these people. And, I had to have three large glasses of wine before I did it. And, um, and I remember I cried when I came off stage. I remember because the then poet laureate Caroline Duffy came up to me and said very nice things. And my first thought was, did you, you actually heard me. <laughs> I thought that somehow people wouldn't even hear what I was saying, never mind understand it. And the fact that they understood it and then the fact that they liked it and were saying such nice things about the work, I, I was incredibly moved. I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be met with kind of, uh, either they couldn't make out what I was saying or that it didn't make any sense. But, mm -hmm. so, so, but, but yeah, this is a poem. Um, I mean, shall I just read the poem? Would that, would, would that, Please, would that give people a sense yeah. of? Very good. He'll speak. There is no dictionary for my father's language. His dialect, for a start, is difficult to name. Even this taxi driver, who talks it, 
lacks the knowledge. Some say it's Pahari, he'll speak. Others, Patwari, or Pahari Patwari. Too earthy and scriptless to find a home in books, this mountain speech is a low language. Ours, no good. You should learn speak Urdu. I'm getting the runaround. Whatever it is, this talk going back did once have a script. Landa, in the reign of the Buddhists. So was that speech some kind of dogri? Is it Kashmiri, Mirpuri? The differences are lost on me. I'm told it's part way towards Punjabi, but what that tongue would call Tuarda, Dad would agree was Tusanda, yours. Truly, though there are many dictionaries for the tongue I speak, it's the close by things I'm lost to say, things as pulsed and present as the back of this hand, never mind stumbling towards some higher plane. And either way, even at the rare moment I get towards, or, thank God, even getting to my point, I can't put into words where I've arrived. Um, and and that, that poem came through a conversation with a Pakistani taxi driver who was from the same part of Kashmir that my father was from, or roughly the same part. And I asked him what, what his language was called, because I realized I didn't know the name of the language. I knew it was a dialect. And he just said, it's our language. It doesn't have a name. Mm -hmm. And I was on my way to work, and <clears throat> this is a long story, which and I'm not going to invite you to talk about this. But I used to work for Hallmark Cards. <laughs> for, for five years, I, I, my job title was creative writer. <laughs> uh, it, it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. And uh, anyway, so, so and he knew that I worked at Hallmark, so he thought I was like this rhyme rhyme guy who wrote poems. And he said, anyway, you shouldn't learn our language because it's a bad language. And in other words, it was some kind of peasant language. Mm -hmm. And he said the Urdu or Urdu is was the kind of was a more refined literary language. Yeah. And it was something about the idea of high and low language right. that that made me want to write this. And, I was and yet the low language is called hill speak. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, that's right. The, another poem um, that you're putting me in mind of is the title poem of your book, this first book called Us. Uh, and um, uh, again, this is a poem that, that seems to be generated from a word. Yeah. And about... I, it occurs to me that American speakers will be unfamiliar with the idiom that you're referring to, or that is your point of departure there, really for your, 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 your book insofar as yeah. the title uh, yeah. itself. Uh, could you explain that to us? Yes, yeah, so, so in colloquial terms like us in, in the UK, in, in a few regions actually, like the North, mm -hmm. like the Midlands uh, of England, uh, people would say us sometimes to mean themselves. So, you know, tell us where you're from, you know. That would mean tell me, and, and it's just, I don't know how that developed, but, but so us can both be a, mean oneself, and it can mean, you know, obviously a collective. Um, and actually my way into this, you're right, it was through a word. Um, I, I've mentioned before that, you know, sometimes my parents, I would hear one side of the family, you know, my dad's Pakistani, my mum's white and English, and sometimes I would hear someone say us, and I mm. could tell that my mum was in there, us, but my dad wasn't, and uh -huh. I would hear other people say us, and my mum wasn't in that, but my dad was, and so us was all, that was kind of a word that I suppose was confusing, but um, the immediate instinct or impulse, sorry, for the poem or source for it was a book by an Irish writer called Declan Kybird, mm -hmm. who, who's, who wrote a book on Ulysses by Joyce. And of course, Ulysses starts with the U and ends mm -hmm. in S. And, mm -hmm. and for some reason, I was just staring at the title, Ulysses, and the book happens to be called Ulysses and Us. And there was something in that, and I was thinking about these journeys that Ulysses undertakes, and this word, us, and something of that, this compression that was um, mm. kind of dramatized even in this, these two letters, that they held this, all our journeys. And even, I suppose the word journeys contains the word us as well. 
And, and it was something that did something in my head and that led me to write the poem. Mm -hmm. But lots of other memories came into that then. Right. Well, I think that, that little word, those two letters, uh, seems to compress thematically this major preoccupation for you, which is the relationship of the singular self to a collectivity or a sense of selfhood that is itself multiple. Uh, and, and that gets expressed uh, through words, uh, through, through language, uh, in, in its kind of contradictory and mobile dimensions. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, words for me, uh, like they, they, yeah, they, they, as a typographical thing, I think about them as well, so on the page, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but also as a sound as well. Sometimes it's because the word sounds like something that reminds me of something else, and um, yeah. Uh, this is making me think of another poem of yours from the, that first book uh, called The Lyric I, and that's E Y E, uh, although surely you're, you're also punning on the first person. Yeah, which, which was a uh, Shakespeare really liked that pun, as you know, like the I I pun. He, he has that quite, quite a lot, and this is a poem about Shakespeare in a way. It, it's, a, it's a poem that begins with an epigraph from Midsummer Night's Dream. It does, yeah. W would you read it for us? Yeah, great, yeah. So, so this, this poem actually, this poem began. Uh, I always say began, and we can maybe talk about this, but began, I, I, never, I never quite trust this word, but it began in the National Portrait Gallery. We're in a gallery now, mm -hmm. British art, but this began in, in London, Trafalgar Square, National Portrait Gallery, where they have a famous Chandos portrait, it's called, mm -hmm. of Shakespeare, the, the one with the earring. And, and I was staring at that, and it was a Thursday night, and they would have a late opening on a Thursday night, and I'd had a couple of glasses of wine, was with a friend, and was staring at this picture and I could see myself reflected in the glass because uh, it's a black background and maybe because I'd had the wine I started kind of playing with the perspective and was putting bits of my face onto his and and so I could see kind of my eyes looking out to his face and you know I could see a little bit more curly hair on top of his head and um, and maybe because I had the wine that felt like a very profound metaphor at the time for <laughs> The, the relationship between the reader and the writer and how, mm -hmm. how you can kind of almost share a head or a kind of identity almost when you read each when you know, and no matter what your differences are in talent or time or space. And, uh, and when I was at school, I didn't really get Shakespeare at all. I remember going to a play in Birmingham and I grew up not far from Stratford-upon-Avon and my parents actually had their first date in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, uh, but it, it, I felt it was another language, I felt it didn't speak to me, and I don't feel like that now. So anyway, yeah, this is called The Lyric Eye. Methinks I see these things with parted eye. William Shakespeare, A Midsummer Night's Dream. I've stood at your portrait at different times, scanned my own face on and off in the glass, a cloud eclipsed. Vaguely before or behind you, half cast, at a loss. Even the gloss back then at school left me looking this blank, in the dark, not on the same page as you. But when I stand here, almost in a blink, I can place my eyes glazed over your stare. Let you lend me your ear your famous cheek. Let the flare of your nostril stretch thin air. Even try on your earring from five feet, four centuries apart. I swear by this lapse, the light on your mouth seems cast half on mine when I borrow the line between your lips. Thank you. The, um I think you, in your introduction to the poem, we're already beginning to talk about it, but obviously this is a poem about, among other things, your relation to English literary tradition. Uh, perhaps you could talk about that relationship and the ways in which 
it may or may be a source, maybe a conflicted source for you. Yeah, well, uh, uh, perhaps I have a naive relationship to, to it. You know, I didn't study literature at university. I did politics uh, at the London School of Economics, and, and it was a social science university, and that was when I was really properly discovering literature, and, but I, I couldn't study it because, you know, I was kind of stuck at this place, and... Um, but so I kind of discovered it for myself in a way. When I did finally read Hamlet and things like that, I thought, wow, this, this is great. You know? <laughs> and, and it was a real naive kind of thing. You know, my mum actually could, my mum was a primary school teacher, but she went to a grammar school and she could quote Shakespeare. And, and so it was kind of always there. And, and, and funny enough, I think I associate that kind of classic literature, if you like, English literature, with my mother, um, because she, she had gone to a teacher training college and you had a few books from that time, and they were like, she, she had T.S. Eliot's selected poems, she'd have Dickens, Iris Murdoch, all sorts of things, but like um, Keats, and, and somehow I associated that with the mother before she met my dad, and and with England and with, with language. And, and so, so for me, getting to know it was, was getting to know that part of me in a way. Uh, and I didn't have the same kind of anxiety around the canon and the problematic nature of older writers in general. I never really had that feeling. I, if anything, I, was, I just kept thinking, God, this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and I stayed at that level, really. So, um, yeah. and also, God, you know, how could I ever be on the yeah. same page in a way? Um, and, yeah. It, it's fascinating, really. I mean, it, you, you, your relation to English literature in that sense was not administered to you uh, through an institution. It, in fact, arose through your family, uh, or at least inflected by your, your family and, and where you lived. Um, I mean, not all of us live near Stratford-upon-Avon, but uh, they're, 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 that must have given um, a kind of reality to the painted image of Shakespeare that yeah. not all of us might feel. No, that's right. My, my mum used to say, oh, you know, he, he wasn't educated, you know, well, he, uh, I mean, he wasn't a university student, and, yeah. you know, that, uh, that, and I knew that he was from, you know, that at least a father was kind of, you know, from a more kind of, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say working class background, but you know, of kind of, you know, you, you know, that, that they, they, they worked in the fields and stuff, and his father was a butcher, wasn't he? And, um, and so, so I didn't see him necessarily as, as kind of, um, I don't know, this kind of, like, uh, remote kind of mm -hmm person in a way and, and, and actually I have to say whenever I read anyone and connect with their words I don't think they're remote mm -hmm. and for me that's mm. one of the beauties of literature mm -hmm. yeah. well I suppose that, that the poem which you read to us the, the lyric I is, is exactly about kind of intimacy and yeah. exchange uh, between yourself and an author um, and I suppose then there's the further intimacy between you as an author and ourselves as your reader, uh, that, that uh, the poem is also traumatizing. Yeah, no, no, that, that's exactly right, and I like, I like that point. Yeah, and the re reason I wanted to call the book was partly to hint at that relationship between the yeah. reader and the writer, like, as this poem hints at my relationship with this person who you know, <laughs> is in the frame, really. Um, but it's, it's, it's some, me who's animating, and it's a reader who's animating these poems. And I'm aware that some of them aren't the easiest poems always on the surface, but, but, but I hope they have layers in them and that, and that we kind of own the poem together in a way, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. you've, you've spoken to me about uh, sitting in the middle of conflicts. Today, this morning, or this afternoon now, uh, you, you've been talking about uh, your mother, your father, English literary tradition, uh, a remote language in um, Kashmir. Yeah. Um, can you speak more about this um, 
sense of your own position in the world uh, as as a source uh, for for your your poetry. Yeah, you know, again, that wasn't something I consciously decided to write about, but it kept kept coming up. My, my father's from quite an oral culture where mm. where the, I don't think there were any books in the village. Never mind, you know, like um, so there may be the Quran or something. But but again, that that was very much that was you know you'd put it high up in the house and you you know on top of something and and you know he didn't know what year he was born in because it wasn't written down. Mm. Um, and um, yet my mum went to a grammar school, you know, and had learnt Latin and French and all sorts of stuff. And, and I think, I, and so my parents had a very different relationship to language, really. And I think I picked up on this earlier than I could articulate it. And I think that kind of stays with you. Those experiences that you recognise but you can't articulate just kind of stay with you somehow. Mm -hmm. No one said to me, oh, you know, your parents are like this. I, I had to work it out for myself. And that, that they had a slightly different imagination because of it, mm -hmm. and that I was somehow this, like this mercurial figure in between, or this translating figure in between, or mm. something like that. You know, that was neither here nor there. Yeah, a condition of, of betweenness, no, but, and but but also of, uh, as you're describing it right now, um, going between a kind of <laughs> go between, yeah, yeah. which is a. Uh, uh, diplomatic position yeah. um, and, and a yeah. um, way of perhaps not just being in a conflict but finding forms of resolution. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm connecting these ideas to another uh, motif in your writing, uh, which is um, images of edges. Uh, edges and hedges. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I suppose a hedge is an edge, right? Uh, uh, and, and that word, interestingly, has the word edge in it. Um, the very first poem in uh, Us is called Fielder. Uh, and, well, tell us about, tell us about Fielder. Yes, so, <clears throat> so I used to play cricket a lot when I was young, and th this is a poem that um, was set on the edge of a cricket field when I played for as a boy um, and in a kind of in a man's team because I was quite good and and uh, I remember I remember going off to look for this ball that had been clattered into this bush and I was like oh god I'm gonna have to go and find this ball and it was a summer evening and I kind of disappeared into into the, the rhododendrons and the brambles and I realized that my team couldn't see me anymore I remember thinking, I don't know if I'm going to find this ball. And I remember, I remember the light was really beautiful coming through the leaves. And somehow I had this feeling, you know, one of those kind of epiphany feelings that, but it, you know, I wouldn't have known that then because I was. But um, uh, and I felt like I just want to walk away from this. I remember this feeling. I want to walk away. I just want to leave them and, and go, and leave this ball here. And anyway, and I didn't. I eventually found the ball and it went. <laughs> but. Years, years later, actually, when I was working at Hallmark Cards, I wrote this poem there, actually, and I wrote it in the prayer room because it was a big, it was a headquarters, the British headquarters of Hallmark, and they had a prayer room, and because of the way I looked, I could walk in and out of this prayer room quite easily and have a break. <laughs> and so, 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 I used to, I, I used to, so I wrote this poem there. Anyway, so it's, about a, it's about a lost ball, but it, in a way, it's also about time and being on the edges of time and poems. Fielder. If I had to put my finger on where this started, I'd trace a circle round the one moment I came to, or the one that placed me, a fielder, just past the field, over the rope, having chased a lost cause, leathered for six. When, bumbling about, obscured in the bushes, I completely stopped looking for the ball perhaps irresponsibly, <clears throat> slowed by bracken, caught by light that slipped the dark cordon of rhododendron hands, a world hidden from the batsmen, the umpires and my team. Like the thing itself, that small seamed planet shined on one half, having reached its stop out of the sphere of sight. And when I reflect here from this undiscovered city, 
well north of those boorish ambitions for the county, maybe later the country. I know something of that minute holds something of me there beyond the boundary in that edgeland of central England, a shady fingernail of forest. The pitch it points at or past a stopped clock. Still in the middle, the keeper's gloves clap at the evening. Still a train clicks on far off tracks and the stars are still to surface. The whole field, meanwhile, waiting for me, some astronaut or lost explorer to emerge with a wave that brings the ball like time itself to hand, a world restored. But what I'd come to find in that late hour was out of mind. And the thing is, I didn't care. And this is what's throwing me now. It's a marvelous poem. It, yeah. That, that uh, cricket ball becomes the world, uh, becomes you at the end, where, where you, you've been thrown by this experience and uh, rooting around in, on the edge of things, in the hedge, you've actually somehow kind of discovered your place uh, and, and some, uh, you've discovered a surprising center uh, oh. of perception. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's just terrific. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, I, suppose, I suppose in a way, because field is such a fascinating word, isn't it? The way we use field of time and things, and m maybe it is that kind of, time field as well as a space field and and I think all poets will relate to the idea that, that you kind of that you're in this odd field of time when you're writing and remembering and and that you kind of here and there at the same time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Tell us more about that. I, I, I'm really intrigued by this uh, way of describing that perception. Well, I suppose you're talking about edges and hedges and um, I suppose, you know, what is the edge of an experience? Mm. Does it edge, you know, does this experience edge like this chair onto, onto this space here? Or will this e experience edge onto other memories mm. of sitting in, a, in an auditorium like this? Will it edge onto, you know, the fact that this, this is this kind of slate gray, you know, will there, will there be a cloud at the back of our head that we can remember for, for a thundery day? Mm -hmm. we'll, walking in, we've got a few raindrops on us, you know, our memories coming in from, from mm -hmm. those raindrops from other days and you know the edges of experience I think are, are not are, are mysterious you know. and they're as you say instances of overlay uh, temporal and yeah. other kinds of association uh, and I suppose because I think a lot as well about the kind of mixed heritage idea that those kind of experiences of time and like I, fa I found the mixed identity thing was was a good metaphor for that sometimes. Mm -hmm. know, how how we we we're, mm -hmm. we're made of these different things and experiences are made are made from wide sources. Mm -hmm. In the way that I always felt, I was I carried different landscapes and in a confusing way. <laughs> Somehow I, I I started to look for things that made me feel well. There's other things that work like that too, mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. we all do. And you know. Um. I, I'm thinking about the new book, England's Green. Well, you have that, that memorable phrase in, uh, in Fielder that you just read to us, uh, that this edge land of central England. Uh, I, I like that notion. Um, uh, it's a, a kind of edge that's central. Uh, and, and you connect England and edges there um, verbally. I'm thinking about the now the first poem in uh, England's Green, uh, which is, I, I guess, a, the book has a, a the pastoral motif, um, kind of presiding pastoral genius, kind of linking it to this long tradition of British pastoral. And you, you start with the poem Foxglove Country. And again, um, this poem becomes generated out of a word, mm -hmm. the word Foxglove, mm. uh, in which so far as interested in the middle of the word, the uh, XGL. <laughs> Describe for us how that, just imaginatively, what's going on there. How, how, did, how, how does this poem come to be? And again, there's a, a reference here to Midsummer Night's Dream, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so and, and often I see the poems as kind of swimming in and out of each other. And, 
Um, I can't really remember. I remember going for a walk during lockdown and thinking about foxgloves and thinking about... <laughs> it suddenly, suddenly kind of occurred to me that you have a very complicated heart, this word foxgloves, <coughs> um, and that I couldn't say it if I had to start from, from there. And that's what led to this. So I'll just quickly read it, if yeah, that's please. okay, and then maybe that says more than I could say. Foxglove country. Sometimes I like to hide in the word foxgloves, in the middle of foxgloves. The exgl is hard to say out of the England of its harboring word. Mm. Alone it becomes a small tangle, a witch's thimble, hard to toll bell, elvish door to a door, exgla, a place with a locked beginning, then a snag, a gla, like the little Englands of my grief, a knotted dark that locks light in grisson, glow, glint, gleam, and Oberon's banks of Eglantine, which closes in on the opening of Gulliver, whose shrunken gull says rose in my fatherland. Meanwhile, in the motherland, the exca is almost the thumb of a lost mitten, <clears throat> an impossible interior, deeper than forests and further in. And deeper inland is the gulp, the gulf, the gap, the grip that goes before love. <clears throat> it's a beautiful poem, uh, and it is uh, uh, simultaneously a poem about words, uh, a word, um, and its associations, but also the world that it conjures, uh, and in fact, a whole life that it conjures now uh, in the case of the way in which your mother and your father begin to become present in your meditation. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's an instance of a word as source, and in fact, in, in the middle of the word, and hard to pronounce, mm. almost a stutter, as you yes. as you say, to return to that that first idea of. Yeah, and, and again, I suppose it, it thinks about middles and edges, and mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, I, I'm from the middle of England, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I'm 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 always I always feel like a peripheral kind of middle, if you know what I mean, and. And, and this comes up again, and the word England has this this sense of in inland somehow as well, and and the g is in the middle of England, and the g feels like it grips between in and land, mm -hmm. and somehow that that was like the sonic uh -huh. uh, center of gravity of this mm -hmm. book, this kind of in word, and then the g kind of and and. Um, and yeah, when I talked about little Englands of my grief, I didn't know what I meant by the little Englands of my grief, but I knew that it meant something that that, that was right. Um, and and yeah, it's interesting that 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 words like glisten, glow, glint, gleam, words for light have this gl sound mm -hmm. in them, like England does as well. And so it's this kind of interior light in a way that that maybe locks a kind of darkness, you know. You, that poem in particular and, and, and your meditation on it reminds me of Seamus Heaney's uh, place poems uh, yeah. where he's playing with the names of, of uh, uh, towns and villages from yeah. his childhood yeah. and so on. Yeah, like Anna Horish and, and yeah, and he, he has various, various glints and gleams in, in the... Right, the, yeah. those, are, those are words that are, specific words that appear in Heaney's poems. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to um, give you opportunities to ask Zavar questions too. Uh, I've got lots more, but um, uh, please feel uh, invited to raise your hand and uh, join the conversation. So yeah, at home we spoke English um, and my dad W would speak his own language with his relatives there. Um, or we often had his, his um, Kashmir relatives at home, so I would hear that language. But, but, uh, and we watch Bollywood films from India and things, and, and I could roughly understand. I um, used to have a bit of a, a kind of sh charade thing where 
I would have to, my dad would have been ashamed if I couldn't speak his language very well in front of his relatives because I was this odd, odd fish really. I was like, I was this, you know, mixed breed kid at the time who, his, he, I was the first from his part of Kashmir who, who, you know, had an English mum really. So they didn't know quite what to make of me. So my dad didn't want me to let the side down. So we, we, I would pretend that I understood every word he said. So, but, but we had this code. So he'd, know, he'd say things like, shake their hands, sit down, make them a cup of tea, and I'd do all these things. But if he said something complicated, I would have been really lost. But you know, the, the charade was that I understood everything. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, but the, the language we spoke at home was my mum's language, uh, English. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, guys. That was a great uh, talk. Um, Zafra, you and I were talking about that poem just the other day, and I think one of the things that I really admire about it is that, you know, and I think I was saying this the other night, that I feel like it's, you can feel thought happening on the page, like unfolding, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you can feel your process of discovery you know, via the repetition of that sound and the listing out of these different similar sounds and the finding of these other words where you get that sort of guh, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, that stop. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and taking that as like the, the, the starting point for the poem. But I'm just curious, like, I wonder if you could describe, if it's possible for you to describe your, j the <laughs> process of that poem's unfolding <laughs> for you in the, in the writing of it. Because I feel like it's really, there and alive and in a, in a kind of specific and exciting way on the page for me. Oh, well, that, that's great to hear. That, thanks, Mike. That's great to hear that. Um, yeah, well, I, I remember thinking, you can't write about this. I remember thinking, this, this, is, this is a mad poem. <laughs> that's what I remember thinking. I remember when I got halfway through, I was thinking, you can't write about How are you going to say this poem even? I remember thinking these thoughts. And, um, but, but I knew that somehow, I knew that this a bit like that field of poem, that, that field of poem felt like there was a lot of me in it. And I felt this with this poem, I had this, and, and I knew that I had a poem when I had that line, the little England of my grief. I don't know why, but I thought, oh, okay, yeah, this is, th is going to stick, this one. And, um, and when I started it, I, I felt like it was going to be a little trifle kind of a poem, a, a trifling reflection on a word mm. or something like that. But uh, it, it kind of deepened, and it, and, and it took me with it, really. It really did. It, it kind of, it took me with it. And, 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 and I'm glad you think that, because I, I think poems that do that, you know, should be better in a way, because they, they, they've, they've kind of, they've complicated the, the origin of the, you know, it's not me and my cleverness or something. It feels like it's, it's the poem kind of bringing me somewhere that, that is quite me, but also unexpected. And mm -hmm. imagine that, that it's very you, but also very unexpected. And, and that's the magic of poetry, I think, when, you know, and you don't always get that, but yeah, th this. And, and I remember uh, I, I was kind of trying to write it in a cafe in Manchester. So, you know, not pastoral at all. Um, uh, because I, I had the vague idea to write it, and um, I was saying yesterday, I, th I think a poem begins with the first line, really, not mm -hmm. the idea that the gears start to happen with the first line. And sometimes I like to hide in the word was the beginning. And it's funny how you don't plan these things, but sometimes is exactly the right word, I think, for it, because it, you already get this sometimes idea. Anyway. Um, but I was going to meet a friend, so I had, I had a limited amount of time. And I was going to meet her in a pub in the northern quarter of Manchester. And she changed it and she said, oh, can we meet in the pub across the road? It's called Gulliver's. And I already had the word Gulliver in there. And I thought, oh, OK. And, I, and, and, I, I, and it was just a pure coincidence. But I thought, I think this is going to be a good poem <laughs> because of that. <laughs> and I kind of left it where it was at that point. Um, yeah. And, and, and you've, yeah. now you've placed it first in your book, so it, it, you know, it's a kind of opening to the, the whole. Yeah, and it feels like an opening. It feels like it led me into something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, and I have a sense being from the Midlands of England as well, like, you know, Birmingham used to all be the Forest of Arden. Mm -hmm. Now it's very built up. My dad worked in a car factory, yet it's the same place that was the Forest of Arden. It's the same place, you know, 
J.R. Tolkien, who had this idea of the old forest, he, he actually, his house was one road off where, where I grew up. Um, uh, it's very different, he wouldn't recognize it now, but it was the same place. And there is something, there is something quite old about it. You can almost feel mm. the old woods there. And he said, that's another mad thought, <laughs> but I, I feel I can feel the old woods even among the concrete sometimes. And, and there's some of that in this as well. There's, um, things that I struggle to say and um, yeah but I, I like it when I think oh is this mad or is this okay and but if it's you it's it's okay isn't it if it really is you it's okay I, I like the idea of the old wood being present uh, as a way of kind of almost giving an image to the way etymologies and other historical associations of words are kind of active in, in the language you're yeah, using. Right. Yeah, like, like uh, words do feel like an old wood to me. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, old wood, mm -hmm. old wood with, with tin cans and used condoms and all sorts of stuff. So, so it's got present things, but it's also got old stuff, all mixed up. You know. And that's England's Green, your yeah. title, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is English, <laughs> among, other, <laughs> yeah. uh, among other linguistic sources. I, I know you had your hand up there earlier. I was wondering about, like, if you have a favorite word in English, this is the first question. But the second one is, um, so we talked about sources, right? And um, it was also a lot about being in the right space, place, in the right time. But mm. also I'm curious about if you have some sort of an archive or a notebook or anything that you keep mm. or you collect that you go back to. or Maybe it's your mind because it's words, but yeah. Those no, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to write in notebooks, but I don't anymore. And I do lose things because I kind of write over the draft, mm. you know, and I keep playing with. And um, yeah, I, 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 don't think I, I don't think I archive things at all, really. Um, so I don't, I don't do that. And uh, as to as to favorite word, um, yeah, there are words that I like, but I always think that w words kind of are different in different settings, like, like I feel sometimes, you know, like sometimes I can be quite a confident person, sometimes I can be incredibly unconfident, and words I think are like that. Sometimes the same word, I look at it, it's like, that's not you, you know, because you're, you're in the wrong place, you know, you, you know, and so I don't know if I have a favorite word, because I think they're so contextual. Mm. Um, but the, yeah, the word that I repeat a lot in this book is in, um, and the book is mm -hmm. England's Green is separated between in and out. But I think in is a really fascinating word. Again, like us, such a small word. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, it does a lot, and I think I'm, yeah, I'm interested in interiors um, and, and how our interiors mm -hmm. sound and feel mm -hmm. and how they open up. Mm -hmm. um, and you begin, uh, that section in with etymology uh, and the English word takes you to Proto-Indo-European. Yeah, yeah. Which seems important uh, yeah. as, as, we, we, as we think about what are the, what, what is English made of uh, yeah. and, and about boundaries that's right. mm -hmm, and borders. Yeah, that's right. In, in, in us, I have a poem called Self-Portrait as Bottom, which again right. goes back to Midsummer Night's Dream, um, uh, but this is like a DNA test uh, that I did, um, and this poem should really be sponsored by Ancestry.com because um, it was with them. But I did a DNA test, and at, at the time that they would split you up into these percentages, and <laughs> right. I remember thinking when I got this that I really wanted to write about these percentages, but percentages are the most unpoetic thing you can have, like you know. <laughs> Even the word percentage is horrible. Um, and so, you know, how do you talk about 80% of me is from here and, you know, but, but I kind of did, did because um, the, the, the idea of being translated into numbers. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, bo bot bottom in, uh, says, oh, oh I think you're, you're, you're oh, oh, oh that's that, on, that's I wonder the... what that noise was. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Yep. Okay, so I think, well, what is happening in this building? Um, <laughs> It's me, see, it's internal. These are my inner sounds. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, um, 
so yeah, because bottom says, oh, I am translated, uh, you know, and, and it obviously becomes this, you know, ass or something. But, and sometimes we don't always know what head we're wearing to other people. Um, mm. Anyway, so, so that's how, uh, but, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's like what's inside me, I suppose, um, becoming mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and really what I'm, the subtext of this is that the English language is, is mixed heritage. Yes. That the subtext is that the English, you know, and there are yes. Indo-European Indo origins for the English language, and um, and and it, you know, uh, my my mother is half Scottish, and she has ancestors in Orkney and Shetland, and so so it kind of does mirror some of the ways you know mm -hmm. the language English mm -hmm. language is partly mm -hmm. Norse, it's partly French, it's partly German, it's partly Roman, it's partly Indo-European and, and then now it's partly all sorts of things and and um, yes yeah, so, so it's a really the self was English mm -hmm. uh, and and at the start of this England's Green poem I have a bit of etymology around the word in mm -hmm. uh, which yeah um, the proto-Indo-European root of which was n e n which happens to be you know the start of England um, and so it, I'm just playing around and kind of mm -hmm. mixing the identity of myself and words, really, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So two hands there. I think you were first. Do you have those moments a lot? And are you, I, I don't want to say sidetracked because this is beautiful, but do you, are you late places because something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just will grab you and you've got to write a poem, you know, or start the process, I mean, it's, I'm just, you know, just in awe of that, because yeah. I love those moments where you just notice, so. What, what, what's that ph phrase where you say, I feel really seen, but. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, I am late sometimes, but, um, but I, I don't think I do that a lot. I don't do that. I think I wait for things. I do what I, I suppose, it's, uh, I shouldn't really put it this way, but I am good at waiting. I am good at not mm. forcing things. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, but you know, we're talking about the the John Keats poem "Ode to Indolence." Is that right? And is it, yeah. Yes. And you know, a certain amount of kind of not pushing things, which often gets seen as a kind of indolence or a kind of passivity. I think it is important, actually. I, I actually think this is why any support for a writer is mm. is such a huge gift because actually what we all have to do and push for work and push for this and push mm. for that and this kind of proactive attitude actually that's not where the poems come from a lot of the time they you know that they they come from a little pool within that time of of, of kind of silence where, where things happen uh, and you know and you know i'm not advocating that we should all be allowed to do nothing but but like <laughs> that although that would be good but but that 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 you know that we, we need these little pools, we all do really, I think, well, I think we all do for mental health, but, um, but actually those moments of receptivity are really important. And, you know, and if I'm given a commission, I can do it, and, I, I, and mm. I do push for the poem to happen, but even in that, I'm waiting for this kind of receptivity to kind of hit me, what's my angle on this? And, and often it's when I'm staring out, or I'm doing the washing up, or it's something else, but, um, but yeah, Poetry teaches mm -hmm. you the importance of going the other way and not not pushing. I think. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the importance of origin stories, and I was just curious if uh, if you had been born in the United States, maybe your father came over here in a in a different yeah. way. Would do you think you would have become a poet? Um, would your would your book would your book have been called Indiana's Green or? <laughs> could have been. Could have been. It could have been. I really don't know. I, I really don't know. I, 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 it's really hard to know, isn't it? Um, I think I think my mum had a lot to do with me being a poet, and that she was supportive of me. Uh, um, uh, and. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 think, I think it is a soul thing in a way. I, I, so, mm -hmm. so I would hope so, actually. I would hope so. And I think all the things I write about, I'm not just writing about them because that, that was interesting for me. 
I sense that it's a metaphor for something much bigger that mm -hmm. my soul would have been interested in anyway. And so I think so. I really do think so. Uh, I would have liked to have read what I would have written had I been from Indiana, but yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Next life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have one more question up, up top there. Thank you so much um, for being here. I just have a question about like talking about poetry. You mentioned that little pool where poems come from being this sort of place of silence. And I'm just wondering if when you speak about like in this sort of setting, writing poems and where the poems are coming from and sort of that little moment of writing the first line and being like, oh, this is going to be a good poem. If that headspace is very different or sort of divorced mm. from where you are right now when you talk about the poems later. Yeah, I, th I think it's like a little bubble. It's like, like, um, like I, I quite like writing cafes now. And, um, you know, uh, we, we met yesterday in the Atticus Cafe and you were saying that's like your office. And, and, um, I, um, and a cafe is not silent, is it? It's not a pool of silence. You know, there's coffee machines, all sorts. But if the noise level is, is not too much and no one's messing with their microphone or anything, then um, y you can kind of create a bubble, a little bubble of your own space within that, can't you? You know, when you kind of, you've got your own little thing going on in your head. And I quite like that. I quite like hearing incidental things. And some of the words that might, that might cause a poem, you know, perhaps is where the, the bubble is disturbed or something, but in a good way, in a fruitful way. You know, a stone is thrown into the pond or something. But that, that little bubble of attention it is stronger, I think, for, for having something to slightly resist, like, like mm. cafe noises and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. um, and, and, and when you have a first line, it feels like you enter the bubble, even wherever you are, mm. on a train, walking down the road, anywhere, even talking to people, actually. But, you know, if you have that first line coming to your head, you go into this bubble space, you know, and that becomes its own energy and its own centering thing. So, yeah, yeah, you know, sometimes it looks like I'm not fully there because I'm, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, and, you know. I get it in films a lot, like, um, not, not, not actually TV films, but cinema films, like sitting like where you are now and watch, I love that feeling. Uh, for me, there's something slightly soporific about the darkness and, <laughs> and, and uh, if there's space in the film. And I love the feeling of a cinema, like, cause I, I've always lived inland and away from the coast, but the part of me likes the coast, and, but I never go to it. And the cinema is like my coast, it's like this widescreen coast, you know, <laughs> it's a sudden noise and the world lapping in. And, you know, but, but yeah, I, I, get, I get those moments in the cinema sometimes. And so I always sit the far side so I can get my phone out and write things down. <laughs> Writing on your phone. Yeah. We're, we're just about out of time, but so far, would you choose uh, one poem to, to read to conclude? Yeah. Perhaps, uh, well, you, you, you yeah, choose. No, 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 no you choose. No, no, no. Have you? No, no, you choose. No, what, 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 what were you going to suggest? Um, oh, I, I actually was going to request something from England's Green, um, yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, w which? Oh, about anything. <laughs> <laughs> anything. So the longest poem, no. <laughs> um, uh, let's have a look. Um, I'm, I'm going to re read one, the, the final poem, uh, that's called The Wind in the Willows. And mm -hmm. I, again, I, I, because I came late to books, I, I hadn't read this book, but I always liked the title. And it, again, it's very English, like I suppose, title, The Wind in the Willows. But um, this, is, this is partly about, about where poems come from in a way, um, even though I hadn't read the book. And um, by the way, it mentions cricket and the fact that cricket bats are made of willow trees. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really about poetry. The Wind in the Willows. Unread, the book was all shades of distance. But I knew the title, and the title stuck. Mossy cover, hazed interior, the species too. I'd say, if asked, it was my favorite kind of tree, though it was never with one certain tree in mind. There was a garden I vaguely remember, the way the leaves curtained like shadows, a lit cave, a fringe not yours you could look through, and the wood that grew by flowing water carved cricket bats 
which was a part of a little I also knew. Maybe it's all a little to do with letters too, the tongueless trees of that printed double L, or the uncrowing tall Ws of the wind in the willows. Maybe it was all oral and echoed in, wind in, the open-mouthed billowy lows. Maybe the leaf-fringed mystery between the two. And speaking of poetry, I had this initiating thought. In the flax-smelling grain of the first bat I was gifted, wind was contained, old power locked, a gravity well beyond mine. Light enough, slight arms could lift it, wind in willow, this percussive wood, a gathered strength, a mutual bind. Though I was far from writing, or this book, that sense, I suppose, in spirit was poetry and early. The very last thing poetry is, is a poem. Thank you. Thank you.